I'm uh, very happy to have um, Bill Grandy here on our show, on our channel today, Razmafsar TV. I mean, Bill has been doing uh, HEMA, European Martial Arts, or Western Martial Arts, sorry, for uh, quite a couple of years. And I think the uh, first time we met well, in Rio was in the United States. And before, uh, I remember when I was in the United States, uh, Bill told me, oh, we already met online on Sword Forum, which was very interesting for me. So <laughs> welcome, Bill, to Rasmus Sar TV. I'm really happy to have you here today. Me too. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, Bill, could you just tell our viewers who you are, a bit about your person, who you are? Sure. Uh, so I have uh, been professionally teaching historical European martial arts for the last 20 years up until very recently. I, uh, I had to uh, retire from teaching that just for some, uh, some family things. But I was teaching at the Virginia Academy of Fencing since about 2000. Um, that's when I first started uh, teaching. And before that, I had been doing the modern day sport of fencing since I was a little kid. I think that um, probably started that around 1988, 1989, when I was uh, just in elementary school. And I did that for a very, very long time. Um, so when I started teaching at the Virginia Academy of Fencing, I was teaching a little bit of the sport of fencing, uh, but also teaching um, a fledgling, fledgling historical program teaching the uh, the German longsword, as well as the Italian rapier, which ended up becoming my main focuses. Uh, I had done some martial arts when I was younger. I did Aikido for many years, probably seven years or so. I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I had done that throughout basically my youth and teen years and uh, had done some kendo for a couple of years while I was in college. Uh, but when I sort of stumbled into the historical European martial arts. That's when I really, really uh, just dive right in. The two broad just focuses of mine for as far as the, the HEMA side of this are the, the styles that I had mentioned a moment ago, the Italian rapier and the German longsword. So uh, primarily the, uh, the 17th century style rapier dueling for that was seen primarily in Italy, but throughout uh, you know all of Europe. And then as far as the longsword goes, I studied the Lichtenauer tradition, so the German style. I focus on the, the 15th century treatises for that. And that also means all of the weapons that are connected to it. So the longsword happens to be the central weapon. That also includes the wrestling that goes with it. That also includes you know, dagger fighting, armor, unarmored, uh, the, the single hander with uh, the buckler, which is the small shield, uh, the spear and pole arms, all of that. So that, that's all connected to it. Um, before we go ahead, just let me just uh, take some steps back, go to sport fencing. I mean, when I was at um, university here, I studied uh, in Germany and US, as you know, when I was studying in Germany, I took like two semesters uh, European fencing. And uh, so I just don't know a lot, but a bit. But did you do, uh, which uh, weapon did you do? Saber, epee, or what did you do? I technically did a little bit of all three. My main focus was the foil. Um, Oh, I did foil for many, many years before branching out, and I did do a fair amount of saber for a while. Uh, I did a little bit of epee, but that was more just kind of dabbling with it. I never really seriously focused on epee at all. Okay, I mean, I, when I was uh, at the university, I did epee for two semesters, but then... <laughs> Uh, please explain me. Uh, they told me that foil, I mean, which is very strange because my instructors, normally you go and learn foil first, right? But he was, yes. he didn't like foil, so he was teaching even beginners at pay, which <laughs> is quite strange. But I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, he said foil has right of passage or something like that, if I remember it correctly, right? The, the right of way. Uh, ah, so that's, that's it. Now I remember that. So what is this? Could you explain, uh, refresh my memory, please? Sure. So that's actually a great question because it's it's uh, that's a, a rule that's confusing to people if you don't understand it. So what right of way originally was in the 19th century when the uh, the the sport of fencing sort of really became uh, you know a, 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 an official sport. Right of way was the training tool to teach you how not to do crazy suicidal attacks. So the way it works, um, the way it originally worked, I should say, uh, it used to be that 
if you and I are fencing and I hit you, you got a point against you. And the person with the most amount of points was the loser. Um, they, they switched that in modern times to make it easier to understand. So originally, if we both hit each other at the same time, right away was the rule to decide who was more at fault. If you, uh, if you saw me attacking you and you threw your body onto the sword in order to hit me at the same time, I would be the one with the priority, meaning you did something more wrong than I did. So you would get punished by having a point go against you. And the flip side, if I attack you and you defend yourself, so you parry and you make the repose, you, you, you've defended, you attack me and I decide I'm going to hit you anyway. I'm now the one who is more at fault. So I would be the one who was punished. So that's how it originally worked. Um, the modern day sport, it's reasonably the same, um, but the mindset is a little different. So they flipped it around to make it easier to understand. If I hit you, I score, and the person with more points is the winner. And because of that, people don't understand right of way, at least outsiders who are watching it, don't really understand the point of it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Because I, I don't know, when I last time, I, you know, when I was really in, in Bachelor, so a long time ago, so uh, when you said you did sport fencing, I said, oh, something it was on the back of my mind I wanted to ask, that's the reason I asked. <laughs> Okay, you know, no, it's, yeah. it's good you ask because that's a very misunderstood concept. Yeah. Um, most people think, what's the point? If you both hit each other, aren't you both dead? And it was a training tool originally uh, that just survives into the modern sport. And if you understand what it's for, it's actually, I find it's very useful even for other weapon-based arts just to understand, okay, there, there is a person who did something more incorrect than the other person. So we were going to use it to train people to understand why it was more incorrect. Absolutely. It's magnificent, actually, right? Because uh, am I correct that a pay doesn't have this rule? Correct. So um, originally, when the sport was first formed, it was only the foil. And uh, the foil was just a training device for learning all the weapons. And uh, eventually, in more modern times, they started adding the other swords. And so... The idea of Epe was it was supposed to be more more real. It was supposed to be simulating the, the actual dueling sword, whereas the foil was the training sword. So they said that if you both hit each other, it was that you both scored instead of uh, having one person or the other score. What about saber fencing? Do they have the A same rule? Saber fencing does have the right-of-way rule, uh, but it has different target areas, and it's the only one that allows uh, scoring with... The side of the blade by by cutting. Oh, of course, they have right away as well. Okay, so it's, it's mm -hmm. similar to foil fencing. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, of course. Then it's the saber, right? You can with the side. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so let's uh, come back to Hema and Hema. I mean uh, techniques. You talked about Lichtenauer and German longsword. It's very mm -hmm. interesting to have someone who practices <laughs> from the United States German swordsmanship because it seems to me. Everyone I interviewed is in Italian stuff. And I just really asked myself, is maybe because I live in Germany? Guys, why do we practice <laughs> German swordsmanship? So back to you. Why everyone is doing Italian swordsmanship in the United States? That's interesting because it's actually been my experience, uh, at least maybe in the circles I run in, more people do German than Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I know. know them more. <laughs> Um, okay. Yes, I know a lot of people who do Italian martial arts, but uh, it definitely, at least the, the circles that I run in, I find it's the minority. <laughs> oh, interesting. Of course, it's the limited human mind. You always make up the world you hang around with, the, the world, of course. Okay, I understand. I understand. Okay, Bill, could you tell our viewers what is, I mean, the, or, what are the main differences between Italian and German longsword, if any? Oh. <laughs> so you, that's a big can of worms, because uh, if I say any differences, there will be somebody who says, no, he's all wrong. <laughs> right? um, if we look at the stuff from the 15th century and uh, just look at the surviving treatises, when we say Italian and German, that's completely artificial uh, because what we're really saying is the language that it was written in, but there was so much cross culture uh, between all of it. And if we look at it just in historical context, the idea of Italy and Germany, again, it, from any historical context is already a little bit artificial, right? Yes. Um, 
in addition to that, what we call Italian martial arts, um, the vast majority of the stuff that comes from that time period is from the Master Fiore. And we know from his life that he traveled all around, that he learned things from different areas. So we don't know that his art was specifically the Italian way of doing it. Um, we just know he was Italian and this is how he was teaching. And likewise, there's a number of other references to the various different treatises and various different traditions that are later in time period that talk about their earlier time periods, such as, for example, what's called the Bolognese tradition today. All of the treatises from that are later in time. They're all from the 16th century, but they reference things that go back to, at the very least, the beginning of the 15th century, if not earlier. And we don't have treatises from that time. So um, I'm just saying this just so we know, like, the idea of Italian swordsmanship is, is not really something we can define. We can only really say what is in a specific treaties. Um, and that was a very long-winded way of getting around to the point. Um, the, the German style of things, the vast majority of the treatises that we have um, aren't necessarily what everyone trained from the German areas, uh, from the German speaking areas. But with the, what I, what I refer to when I say the Lichtenauer tradition, um, it does have very specific actions that are different than what we see from the, the Italian treatises. If we look at just the core concepts though, more similar than not. If you just look at the basics on how to defend, how to, to do basic actions, you see pretty much the same moves. And then we start seeing almost like um, if you take a, a vanilla frosting cake and a chocolate frosting cake. The frosting might be different, but the cake itself is, is kind of the same. So, Okay, very interesting. You know, of course, you're absolutely right. In, now in 20 or 21st century, we look with the idea of nation state, we look back in the history, <laughs> right? You know, and then we try to interpret with the modern nation state view of the world, looking at medieval or Renaissance time. And period, you are absolutely correct. It is um, we see it also in Middle East. Uh, the same things happen because people intercultural exchanges were really, really at a very high level. For example, between Persians, Turkish, Arabs, or uh, Kurdish, many other nations. You know, had lots of or Central Asians, Indians, and many mm -hmm. had a contact Ottomans, and so. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much. And then um, so. Your favorite weapon, did I understand you correctly, is rapier and not long sword. Ah, uh, I, I can't say that, to be honest with yeah. you. <laughs> okay, so I just put something in your mouth, right? I, I jokingly tell people that as far as swords go, I'm very polyamorous. <laughs> I, whatever yeah, weapon polyamorous you put in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever weapon you put in my hand tends to be my favorite. Uh, you, if you put a, you know, a, a dagger in my hand right now, I'll probably go, this is my favorite weapon. So, <laughs> okay, um, interesting. If it, it can depend on the day. Generally, I find the, the longest master, the long knife, tends to be my favorite. But again, that's, it's hard for me to really, sp really pin that down. But that's Isn't a weapon. The that's one which is one edged? Uh, usually they're single edged. Um, sometimes they do have a little bit of a false edge on them. Oh, okay. uh, so that it is a weapon that is directly related to the long sword. Um, it's, it was most popular in the German speaking areas. It is a weapon that technically follows a lot of the same um, footwork, follows a lot of the same basic handwork and a lot of the same basic actions as the long sword. Um, obviously with some differences because it's a single uh, single handed weapon instead of a two handed weapon. What do you but do with your offhand? Do you put it behind your back or do you like in Filipino martial arts follow the wrist of the uh, uh, your weapon hand? It does a little bit of both and actually um, so much like in, in Eskrima and Arnis, you, you'll oftentimes see it out in front for, uh, for the various different grasp, uh, grasping actions and grappling and wrestling. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's put on the back hip, very much like what you see in 19th century styled saber. And you see a little bit of both, depending on what types of actions you want to do. Um, obviously having it in front means that there's a, a bigger chance of getting clipped there. 
So putting behind the back sometimes was a little more popular just to make sure it's out of the way. But if you really like to wrestle a lot, then having it in front definitely works better. Are there any Mesa which were uh, double edged? Uh, to an extent. So just like in um, like Bowie knives and things like that, where sometimes you have the, the primary true edge that's fully sharpened and then on the back, there's a shorter edge that is sharpened. Sometimes you see that. Um, sometimes you see it where it's completely single edged. Uh, I've seen some examples where the, the spine goes about 50% of the way is sharpened. Uh, and same thing with some of the later period disacts and weapons like that. So we, you see a wide range. Okay, and then uh, coming back to uh, Lichtenauer, you said, uh, could you tell us a bit about him and the manuscript he, he has, or manuscripts? So as far as Lichtenauer himself, who knows? <laughs> we, see, <laughs> we don't have any specific hard evidence of who he was, or even if he was a real person. Uh, it is There's the possibility that he was completely made up, but if he was a real person, he was referred to as a grandmaster, um, whatever that specifically means. And supposedly he was teaching um, at least in the late 14th to early 15th century. And he supposedly taught the knightly art of the longsword along with all its companion weapons. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, that includes staff weapons and wrestling and daggers and so forth. So right around the middle of the 15th century and well into the, the uh, 16th century, we start seeing treatises that uh, they include essentially a, a, a rhyming verse, just a, a poem that supposedly was written by Lichtenauer. Now, because at that time, a lot of things were uh, repeated orally, we also see a lot of different versions that don't necessarily say the exact same thing uh, that are close, but you'll see certain lines are either added or omitted or sometimes even changed. But then we start seeing these, these commentaries written uh, explaining what this art supposedly was. And this, these verses, according to the commentaries, they were intentionally um, kept cryptic to keep it a secret from outsiders so that it's kept within the family of, of people who trained these arts. And also as a memory device, just, just like in so many things where, uh, you know, like the alphabet that is, often taught in kind of a sing-songy way for little children to, to memorize. Yeah. This art definitely was, was passed around as an oral tradition uh, as well as a physical tradition. And that way uh, people could just memorize the rhyming couplets a lot better. Yeah. Um, and I, actually, I realize I might've gone on a tangent there, but essentially the, with Lichtenauer himself, we only know what people wrote about him later. But like I said, it's, it's very, very cryptic. There's not a lot about, we, there's not much that we know about him as a person, aside from the fact that he taught these arts. But the the treatises that have um, the commentaries about it. So, for example, there's um, there's one that's called the Fandantic Treatise, which it's it's an anonymous commentary that is attached to a number of other uh, just minor fencing treatises. One of which was uh, was written by a, a master named Fandantic. That's that's why the whole thing is called the Fantanzig or the pseudo Fantanzig manuscript. Uh, and so there's these, these attachments of these various different treatises put together. One is the commentaries explaining Lichtenauer's longsword and explaining what the secret poem meant. And then there's various other different elements uh, that explain wrestling or fighting in armor. And there's many of these treatises that all have this commentary of the longsword and then other things attached to them that are all attached into one book. And uh, when we look at all these various different treatises, this gives us a pretty pretty comprehensive idea of what was being trained at the time that uh, supposedly these masters following in Lichtenauer's footsteps did. Okay, so it was not written by a person called Lichtenauer. They, these manuscripts are about his tradition and they report about his way of fighting and uh, teaching. Yeah. Yes. So it is not like Fiore or like Talhofer then? Yeah, Talhofer probably was part of this Lichtenauer tradition. Um, I say probably. He uses a lot of the terminology and so on, although uh, <laughs> there's, it is possible he was uh, considered an outsider or something. There's a list at one point in uh, the Paulus Call treaties where 
there's the uh, the company of Lucian Hour, where it's all these different masters just listed. And Tallhofer, for whatever reason, wasn't on there, even though Tallhofer was definitely alive and, and teaching at that time period. So yeah. some people have theorized that that he wasn't liked, <laughs> but there's, there's honestly, we don't know. It's it's all speculation. Uh, was, there's a million reasons why he may not have been written on there. <laughs> yeah, I was interviewing a colleague on Tallhofer manuscripts, and then I learned something because he said, open the book, because I have a copy. And I opened and they said, this is Tallhofer. And then they said, oh, that's him? I said, yeah. And he was holding a flag and his face. And so he said, it's Tallhofer. Actually, yeah. so, you know, and I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> um, so I now know, know what he looked like, at least his uh, face, right? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very fascinating. And the earlier, the earlier the treatises are, the less sure we are about anything, right? Of course. Um, the only known image of Lichtenauer comes from that Van Danzig treatise I mentioned. And so it's this big bearded man and he's got his teaching stick and he has uh, weapons on the wall and it supposedly is Lichtenauer, but we don't know that. But we have no idea if that actually is him or not. Um, it's just claiming that it is. And that treatise was written probably long after Lichtenauer died, if Lichtenauer even existed. So, <laughs> right. yeah, of course, yeah, I understand. It's like many, you know, in the area of sword analysis and research of sword markings. No matter if you are in Iran or you are in Europe, you know, there are uh, smiths and signed uh, their blades with the name of a smith, and then some of them yeah. lived five hundred. <laughs> over 500 years right yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so you know we need of course to be careful and not to get excited too excited about <laughs> the time of things right of course you're right um 